Good evening, everyone. My name is Noel Healy, and I'm a professor in the Geography and Sustainability Department here at Salem State. Um, I organized today's webinar as part of one of my classes I teach at Salem uh, called Saving the World. Uh, I'd first like to thank the Geography and Sustainability Department, uh, Sunrise Salem and SSU Earth Days for co-sponsoring the event. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Matthew Huber, who is Professor of Geography in the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. Matt is the author of the book Lifeblood, some of you might have read it already, uh, Lifeblood, Oil, Freedom and the Forces of Capital. And his new book, the topic of today's um, talk is entitled Climate Change as Class War, Building Socialism on a Warming Planet. So Professor Huber is very much a public facing scholar, um, a frequent contributor to Jacobin Magazine, Catalyst and other national um, public outlets and newspapers. Um, his new book argues that the climate crisis is a class problem rooted in who owns, controls and profits from material production. As such, he argues that it will take a class struggle to solve the climate crisis. Um, his book, I have it here somewhere, it's in my bag, uh, <laughs> provides a sharp and thought provoking class analysis of climate politics, which is both highly politically relevant, open up opening up a lot of really important debates within climate and labor movements, uh, while also providing an important contribution to scholarly discussions. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand proceedings over to Matt, who will speak for around 35 minutes or so, give or take. Um, this will then be followed by questions and answers. And if any of you have a question, please pop it into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and I will ask Matt at the end of the talk. Okay, over to you, Matt. Thank you so much, Noel, for having me. I'm really excited to um, engage with your students and talk about uh, the book. So let me share my screen. Okay, so a long time ago in the year 2020, it seemed like things would be different. During yet another catastrophic fire season, record heat and storms, the US elected a president with the most ambitious climate plan of any candidate in history. And his plan was itself shaped by climate activists, most notably the Sunrise Movement, and the architect of the Green New Deal, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Upon taking office, Joe Biden pledged a whole of government approach to the climate crisis and proposed to slash greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030 and decarbonize electricity by 2035. Yet here we are in 2022 and it seems clear it's all gone pretty awry. Boom times have returned to the fossil fuel industry. By early 2022, oil and gas firms were reporting some of the highest profits uh, in nearly a decade. And it was not just oil and gas, coal, the dirtiest of fossil fuels has also seen prices and profits surge in, uh, in, in the Financial Times in March reported that, quote, the global surge in demand has delivered windfall profits for companies such as Glencore, Whitehaven Coal, and Peabody Energy. In fact, Peabody Energy, way back in February, even before the invasion of Ukraine, was able to um, report triple than expected profits. Um, and they are the largest coal producer in the world. Meanwhile, the Biden administration has really pulled back from its more ambitious climate goals, and administration officials consistently sort of say that this is a problem that the private sector is here to solve. And, you know, recently there was the passing of uh, what's called the largest climate um, legislation in U.S. history, which isn't saying much, but the Inflation Reduction Act kind of doubles down on this uh, proposition that we are just hoping that if we create these tax credit incentives that private market actors, whether it be consumers or uh, investors, sort of make the right decisions from a climate standpoint. But we're still just hoping that those decisions can be made freely without constraint in a free market context. So what can we make of this apparent impasse of fossil fuel production gone wild alongside political inaction and cascading climate disaster? At its core, a problem can be boiled down to this. Those that profit 
from the production of fossil fuels will continue to do so unless society can force them to stop. So this is fundamentally a question of power. And in the book, I argue it's fundamentally a, a, a class question of power, an issue of who owns and controls the means of production and to what end, and it will require a kind of class power struggle to solve. So in this talk, I want to give an overview of the book's structure, which is in three parts, and it focuses on three basic classes at the core of the climate crisis. First, the capitalist class, which I argue is responsible for the climate crisis. The professional class, which I argue is driving climate policy ad advocacy and political activity. And the working class that has both the power of numbers as the majority of society, and the strategic capacity to shape the energy transition through labor and union organizing within that very energy sector. So the core argument I'm trying to make is this, to take on the entrenched power of the first of these classes, the capitalists who control our energy system, we really need a mass powerful movement that appeals to the vast majority of society itself in the working class. Ultimately, I argue we need to build a much more popular and majoritarian democratic approach to climate politics. And I argue the professional class mode of climate advocacy is uniquely bad at this. Now, um, I want to take a deeper dive into how we understand the idea of class and how it shapes our thinking about climate politics. The idea that climate change is a problem of inequality and class inequality has actually attracted wide attention as of late. In 2015, Oxfam released a report entitled Extreme Carbon Inequality, that found the top 10% of the world are responsible for 50% of emissions, while the bottom 50% are only responsible for about 10%. Thomas Piketty found similar numbers. Um, uh, in 2018, a widely cited uh, study blamed what they call the polluter elite for climate change, which really focuses on the elite consumption and lifestyle practices. In 2018, a widely cited study compared different lifestyle actions that one can take to limit their climate impact and found one choice more powerful than all others, which is you can choose to not have children. So I want to be clear that I'm somewhat critical of these types of studies, and they share two fundamental assumptions. First, they assume that class inequality is based solely on one's wealth, income, and above all, kind of consumption and lifestyle practices. Second, more perniciously, they link emissions and thus carbon responsibility to those same consumption and lifestyle practices. And this linkage is based on a method of, that you're probably familiar with, of carbon footprint accounting, a metric that allows anyone to kind of input their consumption practices, the car they drive, the meat they eat, the children they rear, into a kind of calculator that can precisely determine how, much, how many pounds of carbon you're, you emit each year. This linking of emissions to consumption-based footprints is so entrenched it's rarely even questioned. Even in left-wing or socialist outlets like Jacobin, you know, when, when the climate crisis is talked about as a class crisis, it's often using this data on rich people's consumption practices. But I would argue this is a very impoverished view of class. By placing responsibility for emissions solely on consumers, it actually accepts a theory of consumer sovereignty, which is rooted in um, neoclassical economics and neoliberal ideology. It's a theory that would have us believe that dispersed consumers and their choices have all the power in our economy, and it's not concentrated in the hands of corporations who control our production systems. Now, there are, of course, other ways of thinking about class that do not focus primarily on your income, consumption, or lifestyle choices. A more traditional socialist understanding of class centers not on consumption at all, but on production. And class is defined by your relationship to the means of production. And that might sound kind of old fashioned 19th century vision, but for the climate struggle, it's actually ultimately about this. It's about how we can transform an industrial production system that's been rooted in fossil fuels for about um, really uh, well over 150 years. But it's not only how we produce energy, and it's also industrial producers are the most significant source of emissions. You know, one estimate suggests that just steel and cement production alone are responsible for about 15 to 20 percent of global emissions. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has also 
um, reports that the industrial sector is really the leading global source of emissions if you combine their emissions linked to electricity consumption. So I wanna be clear that production in our economy is shaped by a fundamentally different logic than consumption. It's shaped by owners who are seeking profit on investments, investing money with the hope of making more money. While consumption is very different, it's what you and I do, it's about using money to sustain our needs. However extravagant those needs might be, we're basically trying to reproduce our lives, reproduce our needs, whereas the owners who run production have much different goals in mind. So when we simply shift our class analytic to this lens, production, ownership, and profit, we come to strikingly different conclusions about climate responsibility. First, we could point out that the entire idea of a carbon footprint was itself concocted by the industry that profits off fossil fuels in the first place. A recent study asserts that the very notion of a personal carbon footprint was popularized by the oil firm British Petroleum in 2004 as part of their Beyond Petroleum campaign that predated their the catastrophic petroleum spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so these industries are very keen on promoting this narrative that uh, you all have a carbon footprint, you're all responsible for it, and you should all sort of take ownership over this crisis with, because it, it takes a lot of attention away from them. Second point, we should understand that every carbon footprint is not an isolated individual, but a web of social relations that sort of are wrapped up in provisioning and producing the commodities that lead to the emissions you're, you're a part of. So when you drive a car and emit carbon, the gasoline in your tank flowed through the hands of innumerable people seeking profit, yet you are the one who's 100% responsible for those emissions just because you press the gas in your car. Third, when we only focus on an individual's rich lifestyle, we ignore how they became rich in the first place. And as it happens, that activity, the activity of actually making the money, might have much more significant climate impacts. So you could take the CEO of a chemical company like this individual. This person probably spends eight to 12 hours a day helping to organize a global network of chemical factories that emit millions of tons of carbon dioxide per year. As CEO, their income, their stock options are primarily derived from this activity, planning and expanding chemical production as a commodity for sale. Now imagine that our CEO goes home in, in their SUV and eats steak for dinner. Now, why is only that activity seen as the problem when we talk about climate or carbon inequality. Surely the SUV and the stake are actually drops in the bucket compared to this person's everyday role as a titan of chemical capital. So here again, the main culprits in the climate crisis are not really simply affluent rich consumers, rather it's a class of people who profit from the production of aviation, of automobiles, of steel, of chemicals, and other carbon intensive sectors of capital. One final point to hammer at home, if Brad Pitt, drove a Hummer, but a fossil fuel executive took public transit, who do you think is more responsible for climate change? Carbon footprint accounting would say Brad Pitt. Hopefully you all know who Brad Pitt is. <laughs> this actually clarifies our political task. Instead of a moral project to convert the lifestyles of billions of dispersed consumers, we face a perhaps harder but more straightforward political project to erode the power of the class of people that control and profit from our production energy production system. So this is the first main argument on a class approach to climate change. The second focus focuses more on the class who drives climate politics itself, the professional class. This class is made up of credentialed degree holders like um, scientists, journalists, academics, people that work at NGOs. And it's these people that are really at the core of climate advocacy. And by the way, this class also happens to be the class most invested in this kind of moral politics of lifestyle choices. I should say I proposed this book in 2017, and since then, there's been a, a deluge of debate on the so-called status of the professional managerial class. This kind of really divided the left, particularly in the 2020 presidential campaign. And I do want to be very clear that there's no inherent problem with professional or PMC class people doing environmental politics, all left-wing and socialist movements have had these layers of intellectual and professional revolutionaries 
But if professional class politics is actually actively antagonistic to the masses of working people, that's the problem I want to identify. So what is the professional class? I want to make three crucial points. First, the material project of the professional class is about marshalling credentials, things like degrees and licenses to carve out advantages in a very unequal and barbaric labor market under neoliberal capitalism. So the focus on educational attainment means the professional class is also ideologically quite attached to ideas of meritocracy and that one's own material position is really dependent on their own education, knowledge, and smarts. But materially, this means the professional class project is ultimately about attaining some degree of middle-class economic security. Second, and perhaps most crucially, the professional class is a relative small percentage of society as a whole. This is from Kim Moody's book, where he estimates that only 22% of the workforce can be classified as professionals. And around, you know, when you just look at the basic statistic that about 63% of Americans lack a bachelor's degree, you can immediately conclude that this is not really a majoritarian basis for a political movement, this particular class of people. Third, thinking of our definition of class as based on the relationship to production, the professional class is profoundly separated from material production, production and largely confined to what is often today called the knowledge economy or the cognitive capitalist economy, where people work with their brains and their mental workers as opposed to doing manual work. And the rise of the professional class really paralleled the decline of the industrial, industrial working class over the last, I'd say, 70 years or so. Consequently, the professional class tends to view industrial production more as purely a source of harm and environmental destruction, not as a system that the working class really should try to seize and control to provision social and ecological needs. Yet this is, again, I think much more the challenge we face with climate change. We really have to transform our industrial system and take sort of social control over it to shift it dramatically away from fossil fuels. So on this basis, we can identify two basic approaches shaping professional class climate politics. First, it is deeply invested in a politics of knowledge, a politics of belief or denial in the science. And this is some images from the March for Science during the Trump years. And you can see the March for Science as a kind of mass action of the professional class. And there's all this sort of outrage about post-truth, the war on facts. I'm actually just learning that the new kind of in vogue climate movement organization of is called Scient Scientist Rebellion, actually. So this, this is a very sort of recurrent uh, theme in climate politics. Um, second, oh, sorry. Second, because of their relative material comfort and separation from production, professional class environmental politics is often rooted in anxiety around their own consumption or what in the book I describe as carbon guilt. At the core of professional class politics is this contradiction. It's based upon using credentials to attain economic security, but the forms of consumption attached to that security, things like single family homes, car ownership, professional expectations of flight travel, these create tremendous feelings of ecological complicity while the world burns. So this leads to the idea that they themselves are the core drivers of climate change. They themselves are the polluter elite um, and not the owners of capital that I argue are really responsible in the previous section. By the way, the person who said this on this podcast is the, the, the first author on the study that says um, having, not having children is the best way to combat climate change. Um, so rather than focus on those that have the real power over our energy system, professionals blame themselves. So in this book, I categorize three professional class types that have driven climate politics for the last several decades. So I want to explain how each of these types espouses a climate politics that is really inherently antagonistic to the majority of working people and are, again, highly unequal and barbaric. The first type is what I call the science communicators, who are either natural scientists themselves or otherwise deeply invested in knowing what the science has to say about climate change like environmental journalists. 
This type of person believes the primary problem in environmental politics, again, is the lack of awareness or outright denial of the science. And it believes if the masses truly understood the science, then action would inevitably follow. Now, it should be obvious that this kind of knowledge politics is not speaking to the direct material concerns of the masses of ordinary working people. And I don't want to imply that working class people don't understand climate science. I'm sure many do, but still it does not represent the kind of politics that can have an immediate everyday material appeal. The second type of professional class climate politics is what I call the policy technocrat whose expertise is more likely to be in kind of like law policy studies. They might work in think tanks, academia, or professionalized NGOs. These types seek to design smart policy solutions and use logic and rational policy design that they think can sway politicians and the public towards these smart solutions. And for the last several decades, these technocrats have been most convinced they can design these free market policies like carbon pricing schemes that channel markets and the profit motive to allow the private sector to solve environmental problems. They even subscribe to what I would consider a delusional idea that these solutions can be bipartisan because they can get Republican right wing support for these kind of free market ideas. Um, so a main organization advocating this approach is uh, that I profile in the book is called the Citizens Climate Lobby. And I actually found one of their slogans is that we are going to outsmart climate change. So to me, this epitomizes this kind of uh, professional class politics of being smart will, will be enough to solve these problems. Now we've seen how masses of working people respond to these kind of market-based carbon pricing schemes. Carbon tax referendums have failed in Washington state in 2016 and 2018 by large margins. This is actually a quite liberal and environmentally friendly state. So as the Yellow Vest movement put it in, in France after the wake of a carbon tax scheme there, you know, politicians are concerned with the end of the world. We are more concerned with the end of the month, trying to really um, say that, you know, like these abstract concerns about climate change don't really speak to their end of the month struggles to pay for rent and so forth. Consequently, because of this, workers are increasingly receptive to the right-wing view that environmental policy will harm their economic lives. So if anyone mobilizes class politics and climate in the climate fight, it's the right who consistently cites the economic consequences of climate policy and lost jobs and increased uh, sort of decreased economic competitiveness. So here's the arch climate villain Charles Koch really saying that he's really concerned about climate policy because it's going to hurt poor people. So he's framing himself as the champion of the poor. Finally, the third type of professional class climate politics is what I call the anti-system radicals, whose own exposure to the science of ecological collapse leads to, leads to a kind of political radicalization. But again, their professional class location creates a context of relative material and economic security that tends to focus most of their attention on the need to lessen consumption at an aggregate level and, and lead to what I call a, a politics of less. So the most popular form of this politics is epitomized by the degrowth movement, which a, a recent CNBC profile put it, we really need to learn how to live better with less. I argue that aggregate focus on reduction and less really evades the kind of class struggle approach that we need, which which should be, rather than saying we need to degrow in general, a class approach would advocate degrowing the capitalist class so that we can actually grow a lot of things we need. We need to grow green energy, green infrastructure. Um, and then more importantly, a lot of working class people that have been struggling with austerity and stagnating wages need to see massive growth in their access to the basics of human existence. Now, degrowthers support many of these ideas, but the, the, it's, this, it's almost the strategic failure to constantly focus and highlight on the need for less and smaller and reduction that I think is, is just politically not a smart um, strategy. I think it's also worth mentioning none of these three types are winning or succeeding in solving the climate crisis we face. So if we're gonna win, we need a massive shift in strategy uh, to build a kind of movement that can, again, take on the power of some of the most wealthy and powerful corporations in world history. So that's where the third class comes in, the working class. And again, part of what I'm trying to argue is largely a democratic argument 
And it's not just a, an electoral argument. Um, and again, the working class is here, the, the vast majority of the workforce, about 63%. Not to mention many of these so-called professionals are proletarianizing. So they're, you know, teachers and nurses and other professionals are seeing much more uh, erosion in their economic lives. Um, but so it's not just an electoral argument that mass support leads to the right politicians getting elected, but it's an argument rooted in kind of socialist theory that really the history of, 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 of winning uh, mass movements have had that mass action element that really where there are these popular demands that really grip the masses of society. And that is kind of what we need. That is why the working class is seen as a really powerful agent, just simply because that they are the masses of society in itself. So the first step toward a working class um, climate politics is, is finding a way to kind of counter this right wing narrative that climate action is not in the interest of the working class. So if working class has material interest, can we say those interests are ecological interests? I argue this requires kind of going back to some basic socialist definitions of the working class or even the proletariat, which is a class fundamentally separated from any means of production, any means of producing their own livelihood. And actually Marx really defines this class as one that was expelled from the land or dispossessed from the land or any secure means of subsistence. And that is the, the process of proletarianization. It's really um, tearing them away from the ecology of the world. So what defines the working class under capitalism is this fundamental proletarian insecurity in accessing their means of ecological life. Um, and this is what I call in the book, proletarian ecology, the struggle to survive via the market because you've been torn from any direct relation to nature. And um, I actually think socialist politics really resonates with this kind of politics of life. You know, AOC, when she won her primary, she defined democratic socialism just in these terms, like in this richest country on earth, no one should be too poor to live. And life is an ecological concept. But in the United States, the vast majority of people are really struggling to meet their basic needs. Something like 64% of people live paycheck to paycheck. Huge proportions struggle to afford basic things like food. Uh, um, and this is all at, out of date before the inflation crisis. So much more, I bet, are struggling to afford their energy bills right now. 50% struggle to afford housing. Two thirds struggle to afford health care. So it should be clear that the working class has a material interest in more secure access to these basic needs of life. But what I argue is it's very convenient that these very basic working class needs, housing, energy, transportation, and food, these are precisely the same sectors that we need to aggressively decarbonize. So if we could pair decarbonization with cheaper or even free, or what socialists call decommodified access to these basic needs, it'd be possible to construct a more working class climate program. Note that this kind of interest in climate action would have nothing to do with a politics of less or material sacrifice or knowledge or belief in the science about the climate crisis. It simply appeals to the obvious day-to-day -day needs um, that workers face. Now, the Green New Deal, uh, as presented by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the U.S., but also Jeremy Corbyn's Labor Party, I think was this attempt to construct this kind of working class climate program. And it draws really from the New Deal history of massive public investment that actually did deliver huge working, uh, huge material gains for masses of working class people, you know. The Tennessee Valley Authority was about delivering electricity to poor rural people. And that slogan, electricity for all, I think really harkens back to, um, you know, Medicare for all, these kind of socialist slogans of today. The problem, of course, is the theory of change of the Green New Deal is you actually have to deliver those material gains for the working class to actually believe that climate action um, might lead to real improvements in their lives. So this is the fundamental challenge with this kind of insurgent left politics we've seen like Bernie Sanders' presidential campaigns. The working class might agree with your program, but the main barrier to getting their support is they do not believe that kind of progressive platform is possible. They don't believe that you can actually deliver Medicare for all, free healthcare for all, or Green New Deal. 
they don't think it's possible to pull off. So as Vivek Chibber has recently argued, workers today are more prone to kind of this resignation or apathy that they understand things are horrible, but they don't feel like they can change them. So in many ways, the Green New Deal and the Bernie Sanders movement put the cart before the horse. They thought a political program would awaken this kind of sleeping giant of the working class from decades of atomization and defeat. But history shows, like the 1930s, that it's typically working class organization that comes first in the form of like trade unions and political parties. That's only these forms of organized power that can actually start to deliver real material gains and thus build confidence amongst the working class masses. And it's only that can, that can really convince them that they, they deserve better and can win more and better through, through struggle. So this brings us to the, the, the other key question about a working class strategy for climate, which is what should the role of unions be? How can workers use their strategic power in the workplace at the point of production to really you know, shut down society and, and shut down capital's profits at their source? Now, in the environmental movement, there's much consternation on the negative role of labor of the labor movement and unions that have played in the decarbonization agenda. These unions tend to prioritize good unionized jobs and no matter what the ecological consequences. But it's not as if neoliberal austerity offers much of a safety net for these workers when coal mines are shut down or power plants are shut down. And again, it's this kind of proletarian insecurity that causes workers to uh, workers and unions to choose jobs over the environment every time. So the standard left response to this dilemma is simply say we're going to do something called a just transition. The idea that displaced workers in the dirt and fossil fuel industry will be transitioned into new and cleaner industries. The problem is, though, that much of the fossil fuel workforce has never heard of the just transition. And communities hollowed out by coal mine or power plant closure certainly don't believe that there's anything like a just transition when all they see is sort of unemployment and economic devastation when these things shut down. We should not forget the whole idea of a just transition came from the legendary union leader and environmentalist Tony Mizaki. It's often forgotten that Mizaki modeled his idea of this policy on something that was enacted kind of in the last hurrah of the New Deal, which is the GI Bill. Over nearly three decades, the GI Bill helped uh, more than 13 million former soldiers transition into civilian employment um, or pursue free educational opportunities. So rather than sloganeering, a real just transition would have to be this kind of massive public sector expansion of the welfare state that would really convince um, these millions of workers that they actually, there is a, a transition for them. And it would have to involve things like Mazaki proposed, like five years of 100% income supports, free education um, to transition to new fields. Now, just transition politics also asserts a kind of limited vision of what the working class can achieve. It imagines the workers are these kind of victims that are in need of support, which is undoubtedly true for some fossil fuel industry workers. But a real working class climate strategy to win has to position, I think, workers and unions as powerful agents of transformation. So I argue a union-based climate strategy should also recognize that there are certain sectors of the economy where it's more strategic to organize than others. The labor organizer, Jay McAlevey, has recounted how in the 1930s, the Congress of Industrial Organizations that really reinvigorated the labor movement they really decided that it made sense to organize in like the steel industry, the coal industry, and auto industry. And today she proposes we should like fixate on strategic sectors to build power in the labor movement. She she proposes healthcare, education, and logistics. But I think for climate, it's clear that any rational pathway to 100% decarbonation goes actually through one sector, and that's the electric utility sector. So this electrify everything strategy means we basically have to clean up the electricity sector and then electrify all things that don't run on electricity like residential heating, transportation, industrial heat. Yet few Green New Deal advocates have pointed out that the, the electric utility sector is actually one of, it's already one of the hot, most unionized in the entire economy. It had about 25% union density in 2020, which for our country is really good. So this could be a strategic sector to organize in 
and it's represented by powerful unions like the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and Utility Union Workers, Utility Workers Union of America. So if the climate movement wants to get serious, it should try to win these unions to their side in order to transform the very strategic sector at the core of the solution. We should also point out that the renewable energy industries like solar and wind are notoriously non-union and are run almost entirely for profit and are owned almost entirely by big Wall Street investors. So climate activists should really argue that unless these unions are really thinking strategically about how they fit in this energy transition, they risk being destroyed by this form of kind of green capitalism, green renewable capitalism, all run by Wall Street. So in conclusion, there's one last motto of traditional working class politics we should talk about, which is internationalism. The famous socialist anthem, this internationale, it claimed to kind of unite the human race as part of this song. So in the face of, pro or in the prospect of human extinction and planetary ruin, I think we need this a kind of new kind of ecological internationalism that's not only rooted in emancipating and uniting the human race, but saving humanity from planetary ruin. While ecological politics often points toward reuniting local communities with local ecologies, returning to the land, localizing agriculture, a proletarian ecological internationalism would have to be global and planetary in scope. And again, Marx and others believe that because the working class was torn from the land and torn from any kind of direct local community or parochial concerns, that's what made the proletariat this kind of universal class, a class that could indeed unite and emancipate humanity as a whole. I think in this particular crisis, we should assert the kind of human species interest in energy. In particular, we need to recognize what other organizer organizers are already talking about, we should talk about electricity as a human right. Currently around the world, there are about seven to 800 million people on this planet that have no electricity access whatsoever. And the amount that of people on this planet that actually have very limited electricity access is even more staggering. The energy analyst Robert Bryce did some calculations to reveal that his refrigerator, which consumes about a thousand kilowatts per year, kilowatt hours per year. This is actually more annual consumption than about 3.3 billion people on the planet, about 45% of humanity consume less electricity than your refrigerator. So I will close with a, an old socialist person named Lenin, whose revolutionary project actually took place in, in a very rural and um, uh, a sort of peasant country, which lacked access to electricity and basic modern amenities. And he famously, after the revolution said, communism is Soviet, or that means worker power, plus electrification of the whole country. So he saw electrification as key part of kind of the, the, the socialist revolution of, of emancipating humanity, and particularly a lot of rural people emancipating them from pretty, uh, pretty horrific uh, drudgery in the countryside. So I actually think there's a lot of capacity global, globally to resurrect this kind of working class vision of emancipation through energy systems, but through a kind of decarbonized energy system that could stave off climate disaster. And I will end there. Thank you very much. Okay, fantastic. Um, thanks very much, Matt. That was great and, and really, um, gives us a lot to chew on from, you know, thinking about climate, thinking about labor and, and everything and in between and how we merge these into to one unified um, power. Um, we've got a lot of good questions coming in as well. Uh, so, but but first, I, I would, I'd like to start off with the political project of, of socialism. So over the years, socialism has, acqu has acquired several different meanings. Uh, you outline in the book, which I've rooted up here, uh, <laughs> that, that socialism isn't just more government, it's about democratic ownership and control. So what are the key principles of a socialist climate politics and why do you think 
socialism or democratic socialism offers a viable solution to the climate crisis? I think at its core, we need to um, we need to assert that the reason we feel so helpless in the face of the climate crisis is that we just see the the economy to this this sort of natural force called the market. And we just say that the market is free to determine how resources are allocated. And the market has decided in 2020 that producing fossil fuels is, sorry, 2022 and 2021, actually, it's it's decided that producing fossil fuels is extremely profitable. And, and we just say, okay, the market's decided we're going to allow all this capital to flow into fossil fuels. And so socialism in a, in a fundamental way is that we should not accept this helplessness uh, with our economy. We should say that th this economic system should be under our collective control and that we should we deserve to take conscious control. So a lot of principles of, of, of the fact that actually climate crisis is really about, about you know, rolling out an entirely different society for one thing, but more importantly, like an entirely different energy system and infrastructure system. And that to do that, you actually need planning, you need coordination, you need social control over the system. And, and the market is not delivering that kind of, and the market's never been good at planning, right? It's just chaos. It's kind of anarchy. Marx called the anarchy of, of markets. Um, so that's one principle. But another principle is that obviously the workers um, who, who do the work in these systems know these systems better than anyone else. And um, that's something I think we need to, particularly on the climate left, where we are in this, a lot of these professional contexts, like, uh, university, uh, Zoom webinars, like, <laughs> like we need to think a lot more about who are the workers that really are in this energy system and what skills and knowledge do, do they actually bring to the struggle and what do they know about, number one, like, what do they know about how to how to upkeep a reliable electricity grid, which they these workers take tremendous pride in. You know, when the lights go out, like they're on the front lines doing very dangerous work to try to get electricity put back on, and um, and and so those workers really have a lot of power in these very systems that we have to control. But a socialist sort of principle on this would that would be that those workers in a socialist society would have should have a lot of say over the organization of those systems. Whereas in a capitalist society, obviously you have owners who decide everything about a workplace and the workers have no democratic control over production or over their workplace at all. It's like a very much a dictatorship where workers have to just accept what the owners say about a particular workplace. So uh, I think democratizing um, these uh, workplaces would really put the workers at the, at the center. Now, I think it's also clear the left and socialist movement is not extremely powerful and it's going to be hard to pull off like a socialist revolution anytime soon. So in the in the book, I, I cheekily argue for something called socialism in one sector, which is that if we could just move towards taking public ownership of electricity, we actually get our collective democratic hands on the core sector that is is at the what analysts call the linchpin of any decarbonization strategy. So, and then again, if we can start to deliver electricity to people in, in cheaper decommodified ways, you might start to stitch together a broader coalition that that would be supportive of, of this uh, public power uh, regime and, and link it to climate action, which I think is important. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I, uh, there is a, a question directly related to, to that answer. And I think it, I, I'll jump onto that. It might be a little bit of a thorny one. Uh, so this is from Andrew Ahern. He says, Matt, in your book, you argue that the climate movement has ignored unions like electrical workers and suggests that these unions can and should lead the climate movement to achieve decarbonization. Yet you neglect the many efforts of the climate movement to appeal and bring these unions on board to electrify everything in the decarbonized economy. Efforts like building electrification mandates have been pursued in at least nine states and in close to 80 municipalities, and not one electric union has supported these efforts, rejecting or staying neutral in every case. 
So my question is, given that the climate movement has attempted a very similar strategy to the one you suggest, how should the climate movement strategize when these electrical unions don't support what they uh, what you say they will. Is it more a case that the climate movement will need to push these unions to this position rather than, as you suggest, that they will become climate conscious on their own and start leading the electrify everything effort themselves? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, I think the key uh, the key principle of of good organizing is listening, right? And so I think if you go to electrical unions and say, hey, do you support this radical climate plan to electrify everything and, you know, ban all natural gas by 2025 or, or whatever, they're going to say, uh, no, <laughs> what are you talking about? Get out of my office, right? Um, but if you go to these unions and ask them, what is your vision of decarbonization? And, and starting from that and then working your way I think that's just a much better approach. And, and again, these unions tend to promote a very different technological vision of decarbonization that includes technologies that climate left people don't support, like nuclear power or carbon capture, these kind of boogeyman technologies. Um, but I think we start by listening to hear what their concerns are. And again, um, the strategy that I'm pr promoting is not to kind of take these radical climate policies and say, you know, to try to import them into the unions ready made. It's to actually let the unions lead the decarbonization strategy. But I do think that we do have this one case to make, which I said in the talk, which is that if the unions aren't thinking strategically about how they're going to position themselves in the energy transition, they can be uh, at risk of being destroyed. So I've been looking at these union density numbers in the electric uh, sector, and this database basically in 2020 showed, I, I said in the talk, 25% union density, but actually I've recently looked at the numbers for 2021 are 20%. So this is already kind of happening, I think, where these unions are being um, basically broken up by this kind of uh, green capitalism process. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, in short, I think we really need to think about what a union led, um, climate politics would look like. Mm -hmm. And then, so the other strategy is of course, to acknowledge that a lot of these unions, I mean, I'm not gonna, a lot of these unions want to keep coal power plants open, right? A lot of these unions aren't gonna, um, and, and that, there's a much slower strategy, which socialists refer to as the rank and file strategy, which I cover in the book, which is where militant socialist activists actually get jobs in these unions and try to transform uh, them into much more fighting unions, much more democratic unions. And I think if that kind of organizing work took place, it could slowly but surely transform these unions into, into having a larger kind of climate consciousness. That mm -hmm. that sees themselves as as a as as a powerful agent in this societal transformation, um, and that I think will take longer. But it's not going to happen by again bringing from the outside these kind of radical activist plans and asking if they support them. Yeah, and we got one or two uh, kind of similar questions, but that answer kind of um, uh, responded to those. So one thing that I that I find interesting is that U.S. Congress. Now, arguably, seems to understand that climate policy is an issue of large-scale investment and industrial policy rather than market-based tweaks, which you've crit critiqued in the book. And this can be largely attributed to the Green New Deal's influence over climate policy debates. And as you outlined in your talk, um, the Green New Deal represents the clearest effort yet to forge a politics that tackles climate change and inequality simultaneously. So we had the... Uh, you know, a lot of the excitement around the 2020 election and multi-trillion dollar Green New Deal plans. Biden got elected. He proposed a two trillion um, um, dollar or two trillion dollar Build Back Better plan. Progressive lawmakers came in and, you know, had the Thrive Act. And all of this has now been whittled down to three hundred and eighty six billion dollars in the Inflation Reduction Act. 
Um, I'd be interested to hear just a little bit more about your thoughts on the recently passed in, uh, Inflation Reduction Act and how this bill fits in with your class analysis of climate politics within the US. Yeah, great. Um, I do think we got a little fixated on the, the numbers of, you know, how much investment was it, you know, Bernie was 16 trillion and then Biden was 2 trillion and but to me, it really mattered what what was in those trillions, like the qualitative difference, what kind of investment. Mm -hmm. And to me, what was so exciting about Bernie's climate plan was that he actually proposed a massive um, uh, upscaling of public power because we already have these federally owned public power agencies called the Tennessee Valley Authority and these various other what are called federal power marketing agencies. And his plan was to just give them the legal power to massively expand build out of clean energy across across the economy and that's what i thought was at the heart of the green new deal was that this was going to be big public investment like the original new deal where it's actually government directed investments that are building new jobs and new infrastructure that are delivering benefits to millions of people now um somewhere along the line that vision got, you know, you know, taken out. <laughs> and, and, and it just, we actually ended up, what we ended up doing is actually a continuation of what the Obama administration did, which is just a bunch of tax credits. They're not, it's not the same as market tweaks, like carbon pricing is like, we're just going to like tweak the price of carbon and then hope the market, but it is a market-based policy where you're actually using market incentives, which are tax credits to try to incentivize investors and consumers to, again, freely choose in the market these good carbon uh, choices. But no one is forcing anyone to take advantage of these, although people will, um, mm -hmm. to take advantage of these tax credits. Um, it's just a set of, of little nudges. Um, and for the most part, uh, mm -hmm. I will say that the Inflation Reduction Act has this pretty cool provision that is called direct pay, which allows uh, public power agencies to take advantage of the tax credits because before the Obama tax credits, public power agencies couldn't take advantage because they don't pay taxes, so they mm -hmm. can't use tax credits. So yeah. it literally made it so 100% of, of renewable energy tax credits were owned by the private sector, private developers. And there's this whole other story of Wall Street tax equity investors that take advantage of these tax credits. But now with the IRA, um, we actually could see public power uh, take advantage. So, But my expectation is that the huge majority of the tax credits will still be taken up by uh, private developers. And also tax credits inherently are a way for rich people of various kinds to shelter their wealth from taxes. And that's essentially famously Warren Buffett said that the, the only reason to we build, he, we invest in windmills. And the only reason to do it is because you get the tax credit. Uh, there, there would be no reason to build them otherwise. And so um, I'm, I'm worried that we'll see a lot of that still, like it's still going to be largely a tax shelter. It's still going to be largely a private market. And there's still not going to be what I thought the Green New Deal was all about, which was like really this like wartime societal mobilization where we're trying to put everything into solving this crisis through a really directed uh, planning focus on decarbonization. Mm, very interesting. Um, so another good question here on the growth and it comes from Romain Mauger. Um, can the author develop a bit more his criticism of degrowth? Because the academic literature on a concept is quite clear on the fact that targets the most well off both at personal and country level, but that in terms of industries, the goods we produce, we will degrow some, the polluting negative ones, to continue growing others, such as renewables. Yes. Degrowth is very compatible with glass with class war, I think, but I may be uh, but I may be wrong. So just at a very basic level, um... If that, and I agree that a lot of degrowth, and it's, you know, it's a complicated group of scholars and people that have different proposals, and but I agree a lot of it is, you know, we want to grow certain things and we want to degrow. But if that's the case, why is it called degrowth? And, and, and ultimately, there is in all degrowth proposals, an idea that at the aggregate level, we, we need a reduction 
immaterial throughput or energy use. Um, now, I, as a socialist, believe in democracy and democratizing our social relation to nature. So I don't think we can say ahead of time before we take social control over these things, we must reduce throughput. You know, with 3.3 billion people that consume less electricity than a refrigerator, we might need to increase throughput for a while to, to, to deliver a human right to electricity to all humans on the planet. So I think it's it, that that kind of fixation on aggregate uh, reduction, that's not democratic to say at uh, one time, Jason Hickel defined degrowth as a democratic planned reduction. Well, if it's democratic, how do you know it's going to be a reduction to start with? Um, the other thing I would say, and I, I worry I haven't said this enough, I, I really think in my book, the core argument that I'm making is that if you look around who supports degrowth and who is really charging ahead with the degrowth movement, it's almost entirely academics. <laughs> it's almost, entire, and, uh, almost entirely people with PhDs, let alone people with BAs. So it's, it's very appealing to a particular type of professional class uh, formation. My main argument is that the language of degrowth, which not only includes this fixation on reduction and less, but also includes a lot of like uh, belief in, in the power of kind of what what in the degrowth book that just came out, they call Nowtopias, which are really like small scale kind of niche solutions like urban gardens and bike sharing, communal kitchens. These things appeal to these kind of radical professional class academic types. But if you ask ordinary working class people, they're not going to build mass support for these kind of for this politics of less or this or these small scale types of solutions. So for a mass, uh, a mass environmental politics really needs to look outward from these very, these bubbles that we're all in, where mm -hmm. we find things to be so logical and appealing to ourselves, but don't really have a lot of uh, capacity to think about what a mass politics would really look like. Okay. Uh, I, uh, related question here from uh, Abby Chomsky. Do you think that the world has enough resources to electrify everything? <laughs> and also enable the whole global population to consume electricity at US levels? That's a very complicated question. Um, if you're gonna do 100% renewable energy, you're gonna use a F ton of, uh, of these minerals, mm -hmm. but, um, and this will not win me any fans, but, but if you look at nuclear energy, it actually takes way less minerals and it does require uranium mining, but it takes way less resources and way less land to generate that. So, but also, and this is going to, again, not, I mean, our, our energy capacities are historical and they're constantly changing with new historical conditions. This will sound crazy to many of you, but there is a, who knows, maybe we will figure out nuclear fusion at some point. And if we figure out nuclear fusion, all these material constraints disappear. So I, I, I don't know if we can, but I would like to aspire to a world in which everyone has access to electricity, because I think we in the developed world take for granted the life-sustaining and liberatory nature of these technologies and I think most people in the impoverished global South really would want better and more reliable access to electricity. So if we're trying to build a socialist movement to, to really emancipate the poor and working classes, I think a human right to electricity should be part of our program. Um, but, but again, a socialist, uh, taking socialist control over production means you are trying to decide democratically about what do we need collectively and what are the constraints we're facing and i think i'm not going to act like there are no material biophysical environmental constraints or limits there are and and my proposal is that we should actually if we can build enough power to take social control over those production decisions we can take into account these um constraints and these limits and decide how much do we need and how much can we produce sustainably but until we can wrestle power away from the corporations that actually now control those things and make all the decisions according to profit, we're never going to even have a chance to make those collective decisions. Mm. And recently, 
um, Congressman um, Bowman and Congresswoman Cory Bush introduced a resolution to talk about public power and they framed it as energy as a human right. And that's a very powerful, yes. a powerful framing. Um, linked to that, you know, you, you mentioned briefly the concept of a just transition and that there's a lot of workers that are skeptical of this concept or in fact have never heard of it. Yes. Uh, and this is in part because deindustrialization has often led to unjust transitions. Yeah. Um, you mentioned it a little bit, but could you tease it out a little bit more, your thoughts on the just transition and outline maybe what an actually existing just transition could look like in practice? What would a working class climate politics just transition that uh, would actually get the confidence of, of workers on board? Well, I do think, um... Number one, uh, we've been there's kind of been a discussion lately about, um, you know, on these debates around permitting reform, which um, somewhat divide the um, environmental left. And I think a lot of environmentalism has been wrapped up in blocking bad stuff that we don't like, sort of pipelines and power plants and doing direct action. And 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 again, I I would say like the um, Dakota Access, Standing Rock, like that was actually what I would call a mass politics event where you had this her heroic struggle against um, fossil capital that really captured the imagination and, and created a huge amount of popular support um, in, the, in, in the society. But so the problem is I think to solve climate change, we actually do need to build a lot of new stuff. We need a massive, uh, build out of not only clean energy, but also people would argue new public, new green public housing, new public transit. Mm -hmm. And I think, whereas the blocking politics always antagonizes the unions, and they can be very reactionary on those, you know, you had the unions supporting Keystone and Dapple and all this stuff. But the politics of, of building, which I think the Green New Deal is fundamentally about building this sort of beautiful vision of public luxury, the building trades will be quite supportive in that kind of politics that the unions will see that as a as a um, mechanism to grow their membership grow jobs for their members and 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 be a real boon to these unions so i think um if we can couple the just transition with that kind of program that's about really expanding this this politics of building the new energy system you're going to get a lot of buy-in there because there's going to actually be evidence that there's really something that actually happening elsewhere that, mm. but fundamentally, like I said in the talk that, that what Mazaki's idea of a just transition really, really involved the, the state, you know, the power of the state to actually make real a just transition, actually have, you know, like real programs that, that um actually you know like right now we're having a lot of people i think trying to apply for student debt relief mm -hmm. and you know that's going to mean a lot to a lot of people but it's it takes it took the power of the state and actually let's be clear it took the power of political movements to to push the state to actually relinquish these millions or maybe even billions of dollars in student debt relief mm -hmm. and and so that's i think would have to be the core because you know um if we are sh gonna just shut down some of these coal mines let's say and and it's in the middle of a rural country uh rural part of the country where there aren't a lot of job opportunities in this new kind of energy transition like to have again like guaranteed income supports free education a real program that could tangibly s be seen as a, a way to transition then i think you might even get buy-in from those workers who are really going to have to be unemployed from from this transition mm, so so i guess policies like a, a job guarantee and and guaranteed wages medicare for all you know being framed as part of the, the climate uh, climate project um medicare for all if i can quickly like medicare yeah. for all would be a great just transition thing yeah. because many people are so fearful of losing their jobs because they lose access to health insurance so if you actually could guarantee healthcare, that would be a big part of the transition. Yeah. Um, uh, go back to the questions here. Uh, what would you say is the class composition of the DSA? So the DSA is the Democratic Socialists of America. 
So I, I, I mentioned this in the book that um, clearly the, and many people have said this, that the, the real base of the DSA is, is, if you remember, I had a slide where it had the professional class, and then there was about a third of the professional class that Kim Moody describes as proletarianizing. And that, it's often re referred to as downwardly mobile, college-educated workers, people that are like aspiring for this professional class security, but because of the increasingly unequal economy we live in, are, are being are facing dire um, economic prospects, you know, working in service industries, drowning in the student debt. And so this downwardly mobile prof professional class is clearly the base of the PMC. So, or sorry, the base of the DSA um, and the big challenge. And I've done a lot of organizing in DSA. So the big challenge is you get a lot of the similar types of highly college educated, highly similar types of people. And, and it's clear that the, the, the organization is not yet really branched out to that larger 63% of either non-college educated people or the 63% of people working more in low wage uh, service industries um, or, um, you know, like Amazon warehouses and stuff. So yeah. uh, I think that's the real challenge is to try to, again, build a kind of outwardly facing socialist politics. Mm. And, and this will be the, I think the last question now, I, I can't get through all the, the questions in the box, but, you know, for those of you that don't get around to, I guess, reading the book, you know, what, what are the, the key takeaways or the key uh, messages that you would like people to take from the book, you know, moving forward for like, what would, would you like a working class climate politics to look, at, look like, or, you know, what's the, the key takeaway that you would like? <sighs> And that's a big question. I mean, some. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try to think. Um, I think one of the things that I, that I just bang my head against the wall every day is uh, that climate emission and climate responsibility is not as much about con your consumption and lifestyle. And even the rich, the main way in which the rich are causing climate breakdown is not what they do when they spend they, their money, but it's how they make their money in their ownership capacities as investors that, and actually I was, I, I'm just learning that um, it's called the World Inequality Lab. They sort of Thomas Piketty and many other scholars are sort of wrapped up and they have been doing this kind of, I mentioned it in the talk, this kind of emissions analysis of, of consumption and lifestyle footprints but they just released a paper like a week ago that looks at ownership and capital ownership and responsibility there and um, found like in Germany, like the, the bottom 50% of the whole country is responsible for about 1.2% of emissions from an ownership perspective. <laughs> so it's incredibly like even more skewed when we look at who owns and controls this, the energy economy that, that, produces all these emissions mm -hmm. and many of these emissions are kind of like out of sight out of mind like when not many of us really hang around steel plants and cement plants but those are really the core emission drivers um second thing is i would just ask people to think reflexively about you know the movements that they're in is it all kind of it, professional class type of people are they repeating these kind of tropes that i've tried to highlight or really in, endemic to this kind of professional class climate left? And, and can we see how those tropes are not really resonant with the broader masses of society and how we could build campaigns and movements? And, and then the last thing I'll say, and I said it before is and it, from a socialist perspective, it should be not controversial, but the idea is that um, I, I've been saying this in talks where India Walton, when she was elected as a socialist to be mayor of Buffalo in her, um, and unfortunately she won the primary, but of course we know she lost the general election. That was heartbreaking. But when she won the primary, it was this incredibly inspiring moment where she was this uh, um, sort of insurgent candidate who defeated an incumbent for the time being. And when she won the primary, she had this speech where she said, all we're doing is taking what is rightfully ours 
we are the workers, we do the work. And she got her start as a nurse doing union organizing. And that slogan, we are the workers, we do the work is really the, the heartbeat of socialist politics. And I just would ask a lot of people on the climate left to think, who are the workers that do the work in the energy system? And what role are they gonna play in this in this transition and this transformation? Because socialists would, would argue they're gonna have to play a, a big role. And too often, uh, the politics becomes a moral calculus, like these unions and these workers, they're bad morally. <laughs> they have bad positions on climate. Some of them are racist. Some of them are even Trump supporters. But the socialist position is not about morality. It's about these workers have objective power in the systems by doing the work <laughs> and doing the labor so that if we actually take that seriously, that they have power, we need to think about how to organize that power for the climate solution. That's great. Um, yeah, so Matt's book is out now. It's um, Climate Change is Class War, Building Socialism on a Warming Planet. Uh, and you can buy it. Would you recommend any um, bookshop or website in particular to, to get your book? Or I mean, Verso is, sells it cheaply. It's usually like 40% off most times. And, and Verso is a good radical left publisher. So just paying them directly, I think, is a good thing. But of course, you can find it at an independent bookseller and um, yeah. bookshop.org. That's great too. That's great. Don't okay. go to Amazon. Never, yeah. never Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, Matt. Good to see you again. Uh, we appreciate your time. And um, uh, thank you for everyone for joining in. And uh, we look forward to hosting more climate and labor related um, uh, seminars later on in the semester. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.